welcome everybody, all you Ayn Rand fans out there in the out there in, in cyberspace uh, who love Ayn Rand's novels. We did, I'm, I'm Andrew Bernstein. We have uh, Ellen Kenner and Shoshana Milgram here, e experts on Ayn Rand's novels. We did, we, we did the uh, series on the Fountainhead that was an artistic success and it sounds like it was a commercial success as well. And so we're gonna start uh, analyzing the psychology of the characters in Atlas Shrugged today. Today's segment is on the psychology of Dagny Taggart. And Andy will give a little disclaimer first, and then I will come back and just talk a little bit about Dagny and then turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kenner. Uh, yes, everybody out there in the, in the audience, I hope you've read Atlas Shrugged for many reasons, uh, mo you know, m mostly because it's the greatest, I think the greatest plot that's, e that's ever been written, you know, great story, mystery story, and, and of course, dramatizing brilliantly and beautifully uh, a revolutionary philosophy. So there are many reasons you know, to, to read Atlas Shrugged. But right now in this context, of course, uh, there's no way to meaningfully discuss this novel without plot spoilers. So there's a mystery here. And if you, you, know, if, if you, if you don't want the mystery spoiled for you, then read the book first and then come back and, and watch this series. So big time spoiler alert, Ellen, big time spoiler alert. Big time spoiler alert for all of these. Uh, yes, for all of these sessions, correct. Looking at all of these sessions, right. So, and I used to tell people in my classes, it I would kill anybody that spoiled the plot for Atlas Shrugged, the first, you know, before I read it, because it's so wonderful. So don't think, you can listen to these later. These are going to be online. So today we're turning to Dagny Taggart and who doesn't love Dagny Taggart? And I want to start with a description of her. Um, Dagny, and, and then I will turn it over to Andy and then to Shoshana. But Dagny is one of the, the main characters in Atlas Shrugged. And just let yourself enjoy this moment. Dagny laughed in enjoyment of the moment, any moment as if the undercurrent of enjoyment were a constant within her and little was needed to tap it. She laughed easily, her mouth relaxed and open. Her teeth were very white against her sun-scorched face. Her eyes had the look of, a, of acquired in open country of being set for great distances. And one other quote, to, just to set the scene of Dagny, if joy was one's fuel, she had always been the motive power of her own happiness. So when you, when Ayn Rand talks about Dagny, you'll always get this sunshiny view of her. She uses the sun, the sun rays, um, but Dagny just sparkles throughout the book or glitters if you want. So Andy, I wonder if you want to give a little overview and then Shoshana of Dagny and her psychology. Sure, and that, that's uh, thanks for that that opening. <laughs> that, that's that's very good. I, I know some people who don't like Dagny, but they are wrong. So when, <laughs> it, it could come up during the the course of the discussion. But first, you know, years ago I I gave uh, lecture courses on uh, Ayn Rand's fictional characters as philosophic archetypes, and uh, you know, many many of Ayn Rand's characters that they're they're they're, they're, they're 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 alive, they're flesh and blood, they're real breathing, you know, living characters. But at the same time, she, one of the amazing integrations that Ayn Rand is able to do in the Fountainhead Atlas Shrugged um, is uh, dramatize or show in action various philosophic principles that these, that these characters, that, that are like a leitmotif or a theme that runs through all the lives of, of these characters. And, and Dagny, I think, is, 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 definitely, is definitely one. Um, the first thing, there's just two things I wanna, I wanna say about, about Dagny. One, notice that she runs a transcontinental railroad. And um, you know, the, 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 there's, there's reasons for that. You, you, maybe, I, maybe I should start with the, the philosophic point here. I think um, what, Dagny, what Dagny shows us, what Ayn, what Ayn Rand is showing us in, in Atlas Shrugged here is, is a variation on the novel's theme. You know, the theme is 
the mind is 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 mankind's means of of, of survival. You, you remember what Ben Neely says to Dagny at one point? He says muscles, but he sounds like sounds like Popeye. You know, mus muscles. You know, muscles. This Taggart. That's all it takes to build anything in 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 the in the world. Now that's a Marxist a Marxist principle that that every that that all economic values, all values as such, are created by manual labor. You know, Marx is a philosophic materialist. Everything's matter. That means you and I are bodies. And so it follows logically, the only way we create values is by is by manual labor. But Ayn Rand, of course, you know, disagreeing with this at the fundamental level of philosophy, glorifying the human mind, and the mind is mankind's means of survival. And there's a you know, million examples you know we could give of that. It's, it's, it's the mind by means of which you know we learn how to grow crops and by means of which relevant to us today during a pandemic where we learn to cure diseases and and so forth so the the mind is fundamental you know manual labor is required notice in the fountainhead howard rock was a, a construction worker worked his way through school as a as a construction worker so manual labor is certainly required you know to build things in the material world but this first foremost and always you know some architect has to design a building before you know the the man the construction workers can build it right as a logical priority there well Here's Dagny in heavy industry. You can raise the question, well, why, why in heavy industry? Well, you know, Ayn Rand's glorifying the mind across the board. Why isn't she a writer like Ayn Rand herself or a composer like Richard Halley or a philosopher like Hugh Axton? Why, why is she an industrialist? Mm -hmm. and, you see, and you see the, you know, the thematic point here is that, well, if the mind is the means by which uh, we, we create values, including in, in industry, and muscles are a secondary aspect of that. The mind is the primary aspect. Then a woman could run uh, heavy industry just as effectively as a, as, as a man can. And so you, you see, you know, uh, Dagny is is a, one instance of, of of the theme. So I mean, I think that's that's a, that's an important point philosophically about about Dagny and how it ties into Ayn Rand's theme in the novel. And then we can raise the question, well, why the railroad? I mean, Hank Reardon's a steel industrialist. Why isn't Dagny the steel industrialist? Well, you know, Ken Danica is the coal industrialist. Why doesn't Dagny, you know, run a bunch of coal mines and stuff? And I think the, the answer to that, of course, goes to the heart of the plot. And that is, if you're going to show the disintegration of industrial civilization, civilization more broadly on a transcontinental scale, your primary narrator has to be everywhere. You know, she has to be ubiquitous. She has to be in, in, in all different parts of the country. And, and who would be in all different parts of the, what industrialists would be in all different parts of the country? Well, the, the, the person who runs a transcontinental railroad. And so I, I think you thought of that, Andy. Well, that's why they pay me the big bucks, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 yeah. you know, so you see, you see, I think, you know, I, obviously I could be wrong where, you know, we're all fallible beings, but I, I think, you know, you see Ayn Rand's, thought processes here at work. Why, you know, why the, the, the narrator here uh, is, is a woman who, who's an industrialist, how that conveys Ayn Rand's theme. And then specifically in, in heavy industry, uh, in, in, in railroading, because that's, that's required by the plot. And you can see the way, way Ayn Rand, uh, Dagny integrates a lot, you know, right. in, 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 in this story. And of course, and the last point before I you know, turn it over to Shoshana, because I, you know, I, could, I could go on and on forever. But she shows, Ayn Rand shows Dagny as a very, very feminine woman. Um, you know, you see it in her relationships with, you know, Francisco and her relationships with, with Riordan. Uh, and of course, with, with blood spoiler, <laughs> you know, with John Gall. Um, you, can, you can see how, what, a, what an attractive, and feminine woman, uh, Ayn Rand has show, shown us here. All the better. The more feminine and, attra and attractive Dagny is, the more it underscores Ayn Rand's point that if the mind is the uh, means of survival, then a very feminine, very attractive woman can can run a you know heavy industry just as effectively as as, as a man. And, and the attractiveness comes from her mind too, right? As, uh, fundamentally, from her mind. I mean, she's beautiful too, but it's her mind that is so attractive. Shoshana. Okay, well, there's it's a 
an enormous novel, and this is a wonderful and rich character. And fortunately, there's so much to say about her that even though Andy said some very important things, there's still something left for me. Now, what I enjoyed about what Andy said is that he took kind of the big picture approach to Dagny and her profession and her appearance and her characterization as they fit into the novel. So big picture. What I think is also useful is to start with Dagny herself and to go out from there because she's she's not exactly the narrator because she doesn't know everything. Not only doesn't she know that the spoiler, she has not read Atlas Shrugged, but she doesn't know all of the thoughts and the people around her. What she is is uh, you know our presence and a point of view for a lot of the novel. And even the fact that she runs the railroad means that she gets to go many places, which means that if we're with Daphne, we get to go many places. But also, even when she's in New York, she walks. You know, she walks and she observes. And so she's, in, in some ways, she, she's like a narrator, even almost an ideal narrator in the sense that she can see things. But it's also true, and this is part of, I think, the wonder of the characterization of Dagny, she doesn't understand everything she sees. Hmm. You know, um, it's, she doesn't understand all the way everything that's wrong with James Taggart. She understands the ways in which he's an obstacle to what she wants to do and, oh no, I know what he's gonna say and I've heard it before and she can answer that. But as far as really understanding that he's out to destroy her. She says, yeah. you should have to be crazy to think that. Well, she's not the one who's crazy. He's the one who's crazy because <laughs> that's true about him. Right. That uh, just as as we get to the end, he'd, he'd be happy to have Galt die even if his own death follows. He's happy to see Dagny fail, even if that's a bad consequence for the company that he's, a spo he's allegedly involved with. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't quite see that at the beginning. We don't see it either, although we can infer it, and Dagny's coming to understand that about James Taggart and all the James Taggarts, well, that's part of the story, you know, because that's a big part of the story. Because if you think of Atlas Shrugged as being Dagny's story, it is from sitting and talking to James Taggart, no, that can't be the way that he is, to realizing she knew. That mm -hmm. is the way, that, 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 that is the yeah, right. that is the way they are. So I think it's really fascinating that Ayn Rand gives us so much of her observation and her inner life and the places where she doesn't quite see everything. Now you mentioned, I, I mean, we could go on about that forever. And sometimes I mark up my book, you know, just with uh, color coding and here we are in Dagny's mind and here we are in Eddie's mind and so on. And one of the things that you notice when you read the book is that um, we don't get inside the minds of certain characters who have big secrets mm. until the appropriate point in the book. Because you know, how can you get inside their minds without uh, knowing what, from the standpoint of the suspense, you're not supposed to know. But Dagny, it's safe from the standpoint of the suspense because she is really, she's wise, she's observant, but uh, understanding the full scope of evil, that's not quite within her repertoire. And there's a reason for that. That's why she doesn't understand that um, she's not just holding people up, but she's doing it at the expense of her own lifeblood and they're not going to stop hanging on to her until she's dead, you know, that she's contributing to her own destruction. And since she feels so strong and psychologically she is strong, she doesn't see the full intention of the other people, including the fact that even if they don't win, they can hurt her a lot along the way. Now, right. yeah. uh, the point that she made about her being beautiful is I think very interesting because part of the way the book is set up is that we see that, well, some, she's described, you know, that first image of her on the train and it's almost, you know, like a, like a close up, you know, go, going up her body and the, and the, and the, the beauty of it and the, the way that her body functions and she's fit and she's energetic she's untiring and yet she's not she's not taking selfies of herself she's not vain in the sense of preoccupied with how do i look and whether you know that's um now when when she goes to her ball her her mother you know makes her a debutante she goes to the ball she's interested in looking well there and yet part of that of course is that she's disappointed in that there's no one to see it 
Right. And that right. it's, you know, for a certain purpose. But in general, she's um she's beautiful without being without let's just say I don't think she spends a lot of time at the hair salon or money on makeup. You know, but she wants to look right and she wants to feel comfortable in her own skin, but she's not overly concerned with other people's impressions, which is one of the things that makes certain people see her as less than attractive. For example, duh, James Taggart and Lillian Reardon, okay? James Taggart, uh, it's, we're told that when he looks, her legs spoiled his estimate because they're undeniably, you know, shapely and attractive, and he wants to think that she's unattractive. Why would he want that? Well, you know, it, it has something to do with the quality of the soul. When we talked about him last time, we noticed that he's got the bone structure to to be, you know, tall and slender and so on, but he creates a different, well, that's not the way he looks when you see him. Well, Dagny, she's got the bone structure and she lives up to it. And Dagny is, you know, her soul walking when you see her. But Lillian Reardon, she's got her own idea of what makes a woman attractive. And she's got her own stupid idea of what her husband would be attracted to. And so she thinks it's completely ridiculous until she doesn't to, to think that he would be attracted to, you know, a, a, a machine in a suit. Uh, that's, not, that's not your type at all. So I, I think that the fact that she she is beautiful, but she's beautiful in a particular way that goes along with who Dagny is. And when we get to be talking about Hank Reardon, we'll have that wonderful scene in which he sees her appearance and then he finds out who she is. And mm -hmm. those two things go together, which is a good lesson for Hank Reardon, right? Body and spirit together. You know, hold 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 that thought. And, sure. and that's what and that's what she is if someone is able to see it. Yeah. You know, that her her body and who she right. is that's go cute. together. Now Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, finish your thought and then I will jump in. Okay. Um, I wanted to sort of keep thinking about uh, Dagny and her appearance because there's another passage in which the people from the railroad, you know, see her in, um, you know, dressed up clothing and it's it's a revelation to them that they're, that the vice president in charge of operations beautiful. is a woman and is beautiful, is which means, right. right, which means that that's not actually the way that they see her, even though they don't think of her as a machine in suits the way that Lillian does, but it's not as if her appearance is part of what she uses to gain authority or for that matter in doing business. We don't have the idea that there's no suggestion whatsoever that Dagny achieves her success by means of what one might think of as conventional um, feminine charms. Mm -hmm. She's not, she's beautiful, but she's not conventionally femininely beautiful. She's Dagny is her own style of beautiful. It, and, and that speaks to her independence. I thought we could go back a little into her childhood. Oh. And I will start and then I'll turn it over to Andy and you. We can rotate a bit. Um, so she, she decides what she wants to do, that she wants to run the railroad at age nine. <laughs> I have, I had a lot of catching up to do with that one, meaning I, I started much later. Um, and she, she and Eddie had given themselves to the railroad, but she just loved the idea. It inspired her. And when she looked at the people around her, she was totally bored. This mundane existence, this day-to-day -day living. She wanted, the only time she came to life was in the summers for that one. I mean, she's, she comes to life all the time, but the time that she thoroughly enjoys other people are that one, is that one month in the summer when Francisco comes to visit and they have that wonderful exchange of, Hi, Slug. Hi, Frisco. Uh, with their their um, their nicknames for one another, and she. So you get this feeling of her. You get this idea of her being very selective in who she values because she fundamentally has values of knowing what she wants, you know, her career, setting a direction, and knowing that she wants adventure and danger in her life. That's what Francisco makes her feel. Um, and that she just, um, she just doesn't go the other route. In fact, at one point when she says to Francisco, you know, I notice I'm not popular in school. 
And Francisco, uh, she said that they don't, she's beginning to get the hatred of the good for being the good. They don't like me because I'm intelligent, I'm bright, I'm, I'm alive. And um, of course that leads to Francisco's slap of her. And she just loves the slap because she said, you didn't think I really meant it, I'm paraphrasing. Um, she, you know, she, she said, should I make myself, um, should I, should yeah, I get bad craze and be the most popular girl in the class yeah. in order to be popular and he slaps her and she loves the slap she doesn't want to even you know she lies to her mother about the slap but she just um, keeps that as a treasure that that's a bond that they share that um, that they love greatness they admire greatness and they're not going to let it go so i'm going to turn it over to andy um, to talk about her childhood a little from your perspective and then shoshana yeah i mean i mean you're right ellen the um the relationship that she has with uh, francisco and, and let's not forget good old eddie eddie willers you know this is dagny's family um you know it's, it's her, I, I'm guessing here, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm speculating, I'm not sure, but I, I know Ayn Rand's own mother was, you know, a bit more socially, was more socially interested than than young Al Alyssa Rosenbaum was, and they, evidently, they clashed over this, and there's some of that with Dagny and, and her mother, who wants her to be more, you know, more of a, you know, social, social type, and not, not, you know, not, not being an engineer who, who runs the Transcontinental Railroad, so there's some friction there. Uh, she seems. She seems to have had a, a closer relationship with her father. Uh, I, I, somebody mentioned it uh, last time that her, it's her father who says to her, you know, meaningfully, you know, there's always a target to run, you know, the the railroad. And you know that that chokes me up because he's telling his his daughter, and this is unconventional. You would think, you know, you well, you back then, especially, you know, you, you, your son is the one who, who's going to do it. This is not. Uh, work for 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 a girl, but her father recognized. You know, no, Dagny's the 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 one here who's gonna who's gonna run the railroad, not uh, you know you know not James. So they seem they seem to have more of a bond than Dagny had with uh, with with her mother. But you know, her her relationship, her, her family is is uh, is Francisco and and Eddie. And it's in interesting about the you know the the slap. I know a lot of people who were. Uh, who are Ayn Rand and Myers have a, you know, have a problem with this, but no, it never it, it never bothered me for the for the you know for the reasons you said, El, Ellen, for, for, you know, and, and why Dagny loves it. Francisco's affirming her own greatness. You know, he's he's say he's <laughs> you you in effect you are so special. You know, uh, as you are, part of what is you know it, it, how independent it is for a girl back then to run a transcontinental railroad and you knew when you were you when you were a child you were going to run the run the transcontinental railroad There's, in the independence of that that's what makes you so special you don't ever kiss up you know to to lesser you know people of lesser stature uh who, who, will, who will simply devalue you know your what makes you so special what makes you so great and i think that's you know one main reason why dagny dagny treasures it and you know and, and that first lovemaking scene with Fran Francisco and, and Dagny. They're in their late teens. And um, uh, Dagny, was, it's interesting because they play that tennis match, you know, you know right before. <laughs> <laughs> Dagny, Everyone want to learn tennis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's a, it's, it's a fascinating scene because, you know, Dagny is determined to, to to beat him, he's she's determined to win. Francisco never loses in anything, but Dagny is determined to 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 beat him, and Francisco guesses that you know he 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 sees what she's doing, and he so Ayn Rand says you know, he plays the game at this point not to win but to make it to make yeah. it harder to make it harder for her, for, for her. But anyway, Dagny you know, strains you know every every nerve and and muscle and her full you know focus, and she wins the game. And I think uh, I, if I remember, if I, it's very sexual. It's yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It is. It's a very sexual scene. You know, it's her loving him and just can't. They they're not expressing it openly. That they're, they're just. Um, yeah, there's this sexual intensity. They have to take it out. Take it's it out on a tennis ball. Isn't even 
a, a good enough name for it. It's yeah. Yeah, there's a there there is there's a sexual intensity there, and uh, uh, and, and so da, you know Dagny, I think she, if I remember, she, she she like collapses when the when the when the game is you know when the, when the when the game is over. Yeah, the, the the there's there's this passion they're expressing towards each other, you know, through the through the medium of 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 a tennis game, and it's 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 really fascinating. I so said next the next morning, you know, I think when. Uh, uh, when when Francisco and Dagny make make love for the first time on their their the, the, the way home from from the, you know Dagny from Dagny's job at the station yeah at the station and I remember you know, I remember you, you're in Dagny's mind you know and, and I remember she's she's thinking to herself don't ask me you know Francisco just do it you know and you see and and, and you see you know her her desire. To, to surrender sexually to to Francisco, and but but what there's there's so many points here, but the the main point of course is uh, I think well at least the, the point I want to stress right now is how sexually discriminating Dagny is. I mean the, the one guy that she wants is Francisco Dancone, there's you know he, who is just a giant in every way, above all morally. He's he and she, and this this is the the love of her. Of her youth, this is the man. Or the, he's not—he's not a man yet. He's a, he's a teenager. But this is the the male person that she wants to, you know, give herself to and 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 uh, surrender to. And and I, and you can see, I think that adds meaning to why she was so determined to win the tennis match, you know, and 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 establish her own independent stature because the desire to surrender sexually to Francisco is is so strong. So I'm I'm gonna surrender to you but remember who i am you know i'm dagny tack yeah and we can surrender to shoshana now <laughs> okay well it's wonderful to go back to dagny's childhood because part of her childhood is that she knows she's not going to be a child forever and she's got plans you know uh, Ed eddie's got you know do whatever's right with what, what the preacher said she's looking down the railroad and she knows that in some form, looking down the railroad, and she's even got the idea of connecting that with some man, even though she hasn't, uh, doesn't think of that man in sexual terms, that there's a man who holds the railroad in his hands. She's thinking of the railroad as something that integrates everything. And as we said, you know, it, the railroad goes everywhere. So she's got, she's got a plan. And so it's okay for her not to have a wonderful day every day, as long as she knows she's going to have a wonderful future and she's working toward that. Now, it's also true that she goes along with her, her mother's plan for, for the ball. And she has, you know, she's read something about balls and it's, 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 it's exciting, it's adventure, it's romantic. And she wants to, have, you know, the right dress and the flowers and everything. And then she gets there. And of course, as she says afterwards, and she says this to Hank, that, you know, the celebrations it's not, well, she says to her mother, did they expect that the flowers were gonna make them romantic? And she says to uh, Reardon later, uh, celebration should be for those who have something to celebrate. So it's as if she's got a kind of benevolence and thinking, okay, I'll try this. I, I know about celebrating. I know about um, being beautiful and, and, and adventurous. And then she sees what that one is like. And because, you know, she's dagging, she doesn't think, oh, Oh golly, I got to go find another ball to go to. She thinks, okay, uh, not no, can't count on my mother to help me with this one. And right. she's and she's disappointed, and she but she's not disappointed in herself. And she thinks to herself, well, there wasn't a man there I couldn't squash ten of. And I think that that sets up uh, the relationship with Francisco because it's not as if they go around squashing each other, but it's but she sees him as someone who could keep up, you know, keep up intellectually and when they had the tennis match as you say it's uh it, it is you know very much you know it's it's a physical competition it's back and forth there are only two people in this and you probably know this but um, Ayn Rand's first image of a heroine you know, someone she saw in real life was a girl playing tennis oh okay. no, yeah yeah that. this is uh, yeah her name's her name was Daisy Daisy Dagny you know not that far apart um, although she had, she originally had another name for it, Dagny, but anyway, this Daisy was actually um, a British girl, but who was living in Russia at the time, although that's not where Ayn Rand saw her. She saw her playing tennis, and I think she had, um, I don't know, white socks and 
black shoes or black socks and you know some sort of interesting combination of footwear and she was playing tennis and we even um have a kind of a memoir of the girl was from a literary family a description of yeah that sum that summer we all went tennis mad so we know that that daisy played tennis and ayn rand saw her and thought oh you know this is this is beautiful yeah this this and it's hard to tell from the pictures of Daisy, you know, as a grown up because she's not a teenager anymore. But you know, when Ayn Rand saw her, she thought she kind of put that in her head. So, oh, you know, that's that's a beautiful image. And it is an image we have in the book, but we see Dagny walking and we see, you know, Dagny in the tennis game. But we don't have to have a physical thing and the, and Dan, you know, Dagny at the terminal and so on, but we don't have to see Dagny, I don't know, sitting at her desk and on the phone and have a lot of physical description of that. That's not as exciting, but the image of Dagny playing tennis, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, the slap situation, um, that's an interesting situation because it's a little bit like the tennis match in that I think that Dagny is saying this sort of to provoke Francisco. I mean, it's not as if Dagny thinks to herself, ooh, ooh, I want to be popular. I thought of a way to do it. That's dumb, you know, and she's not dumb. Um, she's saying this and it's almost hypothetical, but also to see, well, what's the reaction gonna be? And she gets the reaction. The reaction is that's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. You know, don't you attack yourself. Don't you attack values. Beautifully oh, put. Yeah. Right, right, right. Now, when I teach this- Oh, I love students, yes. Yeah, I, I do tell them, do not try this at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do not try this at home. Um, just, you know, don't. Um, and, Actually, you know, the, the first uh, romantic in, encounter, I, I say also do not try this at home because what we're told is that the way that she looks at him shows that she'd given him permission long ago. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, unless you, you actually can know what everybody's thinking, don't try that, which you can't, uh, right. don't, don't try this at home. But it's also true the way Ayn Rand sets it up, it is from her point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that um, she thought she must escape. Yeah, you know, there's just sort of like this momentary, what is this? And then she pulls him down to her. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's well, you, you almost can't even summarize it because it's just described. And what it is, you know, and then afterwards he names the meaning of it. It doesn't follow the tennis match right away, but it is part of the same movement because what this movement is about, and maybe this is a way to think about Dagny and Francisco, is that he's several steps ahead of her. Mm -hmm. You know, when he comes that summer, he looks at her differently. He's figured something out and some connection between who she is and how she's gonna run the railroad, you know, you know, physically and in relation to him. While I don't think that she has thought, oh, Francisco, she hasn't thought, well, you know, he's, He's more interesting than the other boys. She's not thinking about boys. There wasn't a boy she couldn't squash ten of, and she wasn't. That wasn't present to her. And Francisco, she's not thinking of him as. When is he going to make his move? How am I going to attract him? She's not thinking about any of that. But Francisco looks at her. He's a little older, yeah. and I, and he knows where this is going. And she doesn't. And I think that that's kind of interesting with Dagny is that with Francisco, she doesn't, to the extent that we're inside her mind, she doesn't know where this is going. Yeah. And we see that repeated later on with Reardon. She doesn't know where this is going until right. it goes. You know. And while, while Reardon, he's three steps ahead of her. Now, when we get to the last part of the book, you know, it's... Um, there's an excuse for one for one one of them being three steps ahead of her, and it's because the, because they haven't met. But as soon as she meets him, she figures it out, which I think is one of the you know the relationship with Galt, which is one of the ways that those three are different are different. You know, with the extent to which she understands. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just jump in with two more things on the childhood. We could wrap that up, and then we could move on to. You know, as a psychologist, I always look at what is a person's view of number one, themselves. Number two, what is their view of other people in general? And number three, what I don't want to overload you here, so maybe we'll just do this, but I'll just say that 
what is their view of the world and their future? So I put two in that one. So the world and their future. But I want to just wrap up the childhood part by um, talking a little bit about her future. That it, as a young kid, she's saying she had glimpsed, I'm, I'm reading the quote here, she had glimpsed another world and she knew that it existed. The world that had created trains, bridges, telegraph wires, and signal lights winking in the night. I love Ayn Rand's descriptions. <laughs> she had to wait, she thought, and grow up to that world. And another quote is, Dagny lived in the future, the world she hoped to find, except for that one month of the year when Francisco would visit. Uh, so that's one point. And the other is her view of herself. This is a segue into talking about her view of herself, her view of others, and into relationship with them. And then her view of the world, which is what I'm, uh, but on herself, she had heard it, she had heard herself called selfish when she was young. Now, when I was called selfish as a kid, and when you were called selfish, I'm assuming we all were, it rattled me. Um, but for her, she asked herself, she asked the people, well, what does that mean, that I'm selfish? And she never received an answer. And she, she looked at it and said, well, that's really vague. How could they imagine that she could feel guilt from an undefined accusation? So Ayn Rand gives us these nuggets, these gems, these gifts of taking that away in our own minds. Like if somebody accuses me of something and they're not specific, they're vague, I don't want to accuse myself. That's the unearned guilt. So um, getting back to Daphne though, her, her profound certainty about herself, I, you know, and her view of the future, maybe we can leave others to another time, just herself and maybe her view of the future. Andy? Well, I mean, I mean, you're, you're right, Ellen. There's, there's such a, there's a, there's a quiet self-confidence. All of Ayn Rand's heroes and, and heroines have it. They, you know, they, they, they believe in themselves. And, and as such, you know, they don't, they, they need the cringe from, you know, undeserved criticism because, you know, they're, they're not dependent, you know, they're first handed in the terms of the fountainhead. They're not dependent on the assessment of others for their, for their self-esteem. And at the same time, be, because of their self-confidence, they're, they're not boastful. They don't, they don't feel the need, you know, to, you know, to uh, have a, have a megaphone to the world of, look at me. I am the greatest, uh, I am the greatest railroad executive in the, in the world. Dagny, Dagny, Dagny's not about that. She's, you know, she's about, um, you know, her own, her own goals, her own values, and she, she, she knows that from from a very from a very early age. She self, she's self directed. She know, she knows what she not only knows what she wants to do, which is rare enough, you know, to to know that at such an early age, but what she wants to do is enormously unconventional for a girl back then. Maybe maybe even today, you know, a, a girl might be discouraged from running a transcontinental railroad. Um, I don't I don't know, but certainly certainly back in you know 1950, that was not something that that girls aspire to. But that doesn't matter to Dagny. This is me. This is what I want. You know, this 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 is this is this is who I am. And she's very you know, she's she's very much like Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead. She's self she's self generated. She's you know she's she's self initiated. And when we see that from her youth, and it's interesting because she doesn't have to change at a fundamental level you know, any more than, than Rock does in, in the Fountainhead. But as, you know, Shoshana was, what you, you were saying before, she, she they, 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 we'll, we'll see as, as we go deeper into the, into the story, there is, um, there is a honest mistake that she makes and she needs, she needs to change her mind. She needs to understand things that she, she doesn't under, understand uh, at this point, things that John Galt is the first, you know, the first person in history to understand uh, in the in the fictional world, because Ayn Rand in real life is the first person in history to understand. And part of your know, big part of this is the, you know, the the the, the nature the nature of evil, uh, and and how it operates. So so Dagny uh, fundamentally self generated, self initiated doesn't have to doesn't have to alter any any anything about her, her, found, her foundation, but that she, she is making a mistake uh, over the course of, of the story. And we'll, we'll see that as, as, as we right. yeah, she, yeah, she goes. And again, but that's just me. Independent, independent judgment, Ayn Rand shows us, 
in the fountainhead. And again, here, independent, independent judgment is when you're, you're your own rational mind and going by your own judgment, not following or rebelling against the beliefs of others is a self-correcting mechanism and allows you to make these, the, to make these course corrections. And we see Dominique do it in the fountainhead. Uh, we, 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 you know, we, we see her change her mind on, on important issues because she's independent. And we see, we'll see Dagny do the same thing and for the right. same reason. So, okay. Yeah, I think that's wonderful the way that you, you tie her view of her work uh, and her view of herself and her view of her future, because all those things go together. And that's part of the, the wonderfulness of Dagny is that she thinks that she can have what she wants and, and that it's all up to her, you know, and, um, and, and if other people are obstacles, she can push them away because she thinks that they just want to be parasites. Okay, they can be parasites. I can keep going. I've got enough energy for 10 million people. And she really, and, you know, and again, it's like Rourke. She'll Rourke doesn't self, yeah he, doesn't, yeah, he doesn't self doubt. And yeah. yet also like Dagny, he doesn't need to go bragging. I'm the biggest architect, the greatest architect ever. You know, he's not boastful. He's, um, He's remember he he said in the fountain that he didn't want his, the the sculpture to be made of him, and um, you know it's something more more abstract. And so I, I think that Dagny also there's a kind of complete self confidence which pertains to not wanting not accepting unearned guilt and ridiculous uh, accusations or characterizations, but also the the certainty that they can't stop me, that yeah. that they can't stop me, and part of the interest in uh, in the story is that under a lot of circumstances if she were in Howard Rourke's world she couldn't be stopped because he in that you know it's a different world mm -hmm. and with evil in a different situation and and so on but you know if she, if she were if she were in Howard Rourke's world she could have her railroad she could build her John Galt line and I think that in fact that whole part of the novel feels almost like the fountainhead and that um, it was a hard thing and yet there were there was reason to hope and working day and night and overcoming the opposition and then in the end you know there she is on the line you know like rook up on top of the building that she won but right. because this is a different world and the other the situation she's in is different and the questions she has to ask about it aren't the questions that rook would have to that you know, she asks the questions Rourke asks, can I do this? Yeah, I can do this. I can do this. Right. And so she's Go ahead. Yeah. Let, me, and let, me, let me just jump, jump in for a second here, Shoshana, because you reminded me, you know, I wrote an essay, The, the Freedom Gradient in Ayn Rand's novels. And, um, uh, and, and you're really hitting on an important point here because in, in We the Living, you know, you're, you're in a communist state, you don't have the freedom to achieve your values and, and all the main characters are crushed. In Anthem, you're, you're in a worse totalitarian state, there's no possibility of achieving your values in that society. And the good guys have to escape, you know, and start their own society. In, in Atlas Shrugged, the society's disintegrating into a totalitarian state. And again, the good guys go on strike and they have to start, they have, and they have to start their own you know their their own colony. You know their 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 own country. In 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 effect, in, no, in none of those novels is there sufficient freedom for uh, the Howard Rock types or the Dagny Taggart types to to uh, achieve their values in that society. Mm -hmm. They're either crushed or they have to escape that society. The Fountainhead is the only one of Ayn Rand's novels which is which is set in you know in, in early mixed economy America, 1930. You know it's still it, it's still freedom. Uh, there's still enough freedom to for the for the the, the real heroes and heroines to achieve their values. So you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. That, that's the fact, the world of the fountainhead is the one of a uh, universe that Iron Man created where Dagny Taggart would be free to, uh, to achieve her values in, in society, not have to go outside, just not be crushed by that society and not have to go outside that so society. And uh, Howard Rock does, and, and he, he's the only one in her novels who's free enough to, to achieve his values in the society in which he lives. Yeah. The one thing I didn't mention, which I think pertains to her childhood, is that uh, when Francisco tells, you know, tells her things are going to be different from now on, and you won't understand what I'm doing, and he, you know, helped me to refuse, even though I know he's right, and and she doesn't get an explanation. Right. 
you know, she sees many things that don't make sense. And I have to say, I think this is a really cruel and unusual punishment for Dagny because Dagny loves figuring things out. Mm -hmm. And she thought that she knew this man inside out. And she thought she knew what his values were. And look what he's, look what's going on now. It's almost as if he's turned, it's confusing, you know, right. and, and she, he wanted to slap her when she was even in a question acting as if she was somehow less than herself. Mm -hmm. What's going, oh, what's going, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, what's 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 going on here? He's it looks as as if he's actually acting beneath himself. Now, when he actually talks to her, as you know, and we get that scene that comes after we we know about their past, he says things in an elliptical way that can be understood in different ways, and he well, she, doesn't he, he doesn't want a straight out lie to her, but yeah. it's confusing. It's right, confusing. but he gives her mixed messages because she always yes. sees the same Francisco playing with marbles, that precision with the marbles, the look in his eyes, that confidence he exudes. The same, he's the same person, and yet he's a playboy, yeah. you know. And, and you just get this juxtap this great juxtaposition. And she, you're right though, she doesn't slap him. She should have. Yeah. Yeah, there's that one. There's that one scene uh, there where she's talking to Eddie. You know about about you know Francisco's the latest depredations of Francisco. What she she calls him a she called him a bastard. I forget what I forget what she, some you know derogatory term she applies to him. And, and Eddie's like stunned. He says, "He's Dagny. It's it's Frisco Dancona." And she says, "She says it was." Yeah. Well, he he collects his slap later in the book. Just saying. Yeah, okay. he does. Right. Yes. <laughs> You're good. You're good. He yeah. does, and he's able to control himself so that the person who slaps him isn't killed. So yeah. going back to the, what you just brought up, um, I think when I, another thing is in psychology, I always look for coping strategies. It seems so odd to apply it to Dagny, but how does she cope with that injury? And so um, I have a quote here. Uh, she, she faced with astonished indignation, the ugly part of feeling pain, and she refused to let it matter. Suffering was, a, was a senseless accident. It was not part of the world as she saw it. She would not allow pain to become important. She had no name for the kind of resistance she had or, or from where the resistance came. It, but she had that idea of it doesn't count. It's not to be taken seriously, however. So you get this feeling of, what did she repress this? You know, what the heck's going on here? She fought it, she recovered um, years, years. So Ayn Rand is saying this wasn't a quick process. Years helped her to reach the day when she could face her memories indifferently. And then the day when she felt no necessity to do so. It was finished and there was no necessity any longer. There were no other men in her life at, at that point. Um, so you get this sense of her really holding on to her benevolent universe premises that this this is my life. It's suffering, but I'm not going to let it go down too deep. You know, I'll process it. It might take me years to process. It'll be an open question mark, and I will look for evidence. But um, but she just copes amazingly well. I mean, we could talk about many instances, but um, Andy. Well, she's got well, she's got the music. Yeah, but go ahead, Andy. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ellen. Was there a question there? Oh yeah, just her coping strategies with all of the things that she comes up against. Her her endurance to be able to put up with the, the first making the John Galt line, then losing it, going out to the Berkshire, her cabin cottage in the Berkshires. You know, she uh, you know, even seeing what happens to John Galt, but how how would you look at her ability to deal with the negatives in her life? Because we take from that. We right. learn from that. Right. You know, I, I think uh, the, the, to put it to put it simply, in essential terms, it's good to have values. <laughs> you, see, you know, I mean, I know that's that sounds like a simple-minded statement, but it is it is really good to have values. I think values are the great difference difference maker in a in a person's life. They're the meaning maker in a person's life, and I think we should define define that term because it's 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 critical. You know, values. Ayn Rand defines them that, that which one acts to gain and, and or keep. And I think, you know, to put it to put it more simply, 
the values are the things that you find valuable. They're the things that you find worthwhile, the things that are so important to you that they impel you to goal-directed action. So, you know, if you value education in a specific field or a career, you know, in this area or a particular man or, or woman, or you, if you have children and you, you love, you love your children, to put it simply, these are, these are the things that you love and that bring, things or persons that you love and they bring meaning, passion, purpose into your life. Well, Dagny had, and, 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 and Ayn Rand's very clear, values are that which uh are rational that is they are that which promote human but, life and i'm talking about and i know that we probably should start to wrap up um but that when you're talking about values how does she cope with the loss of her values she yeah, worked well, so hard to build a railroad the right. john Galt line right and then gives it away and then loses it completely has to, right. she has to take it apart Right. Well, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm so getting, how, getting how, What would you say about her psychology? Um, you And we'll wrap up with this, but you can talk and then Shoshana if you want. Yeah, to. well, I, but Dagny has values. She knows she's going to run the railroad. This is what she loves. She, you know, she's, why it's so hard for her to give that up, you know, give up a transcontinental railroad for, you know, three miles of track or something in the valley. You know, she says, so, when your know, romantic heartbreak, I, I assume everybody here has gone through it at, at some point. It's painful. I mean, it's just agonizing. Like, you know, somebody, it's like somebody rips your heart out, you know, and, and throws it in the, you know, in, in the gutter and then chops up into little pieces. It's, it's painful. So, you know, the, the relationship, the way the relationship with Francisco ends, but she has that, that foundation of, of, of what makes me me, what, what gives meaning in my life is, is, is the railroads, what I love. And so the John Galt line is destroyed again. It's, it's painful, but I'm gonna, I have the railroad. I'm gonna keep running the, the railroad. This is what I love. This is the way Howard Rock loves architecture. Notice he certainly loves Dominique Franken. She's the most important human being in the universe to him. Mm -hmm. But architecture comes first and it's, oh. and it's Similarly here with Dagny, you know, when I, when I lose these specific values, including the John Gwalt line is destroyed, it's agonizingly painful, but I have the railroad, this, I have the, I have the dream job, you know, I'm, I'm running the transcontinental railroad and I'm going to keep doing it. This, this is what I she love. This, this is the goal. Right. What's she it? never loses herself and she's still, but her future, the, Dagny's future, which is always wide open, you know, it's just... You could, you can hug her future, right? It's, it's just, she could do anything she wants, and it becomes very foreshortened when she's out at the cottage. You know, she just doesn't see what's the use. Oh, you know, um, so she, but she does rebound. She's just so good at coming back after adversity hits. And I think Shoshana, what lesson can we take away from that? And what did you notice about uh, Dagny and her coping strategies? Okay, well, I know we need to wrap things up, but it's actually a, a big subject because um, what happens to the John Galt line and what happens to her commitment to the railroad are not exactly the same as the story with Francisco. The thing with the line is that there's a particular kind of plot against it. Mm -hmm. And Dagny's way of looking at obstacles is okay, that's one, but there's another day and I'll, I'll make something else. And so it's painful, but it's not as if she's got anything in herself to blame. And it's not as if that line wasn't really good. Yeah. Okay. It was supposed to last. I think that's really important to her is that she doesn't have to think that there was anything wrong with that line and that it was really worth everything that she put into it. The reason that she retreats to the cabin is, oh no, you know, now there's now there's a, there's an obstacle that I don't know how to deal with because I don't want to be a slave driver and I'm not going to be a slave, and so I can't be part of that. But she, she, re, I think that she assumes that that directive is not going to be in force forever, and she's not a political activist that she's, you know. Who, whom do I have to kill or bribe to get rid of that? She doesn't have a plan for that, but she does have a plan for preserving herself. And she knows I'm not gonna be a slave driver. I'm not gonna be a slave. Okay, I've got a principle, I've got a plan. I'm out of here and I will figure out what to do later when, because the circumstances are gonna change. It's not as yeah. if that directive was always there. Now, the thing with Francisco, yeah. that's trickier because that doesn't make any sense 
and with the John Galt line, yeah, we, she's, you can see that she's, she, 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 she can see what's going with, and yeah. with Francisco, it's, it, it, it's a mystery. And, you know, they say what's worse than biting into an apple and finding a worm. What's worse is biting into an apple and finding half a worm. <laughs> okay. So, so here it looks as if, well, who was this man? You know, what, what, what happened? And that's very, very troubling. Now she doesn't, again, this is Dagny. She doesn't think, well, I was stupid. I missed this. I didn't see that. No, there's, there's nothing for her to notice that she missed. There's something here that doesn't make sense. And it is in the area of psychology. You know, who, who, who is he? Does anyone, does someone have a gun to his head? You know, what's, what's going on here? No, it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't make any sense. And that's very hard. And so it's not just the pain, right? It's not just the pain. It's that it doesn't make sense. And that's why when I read the book, well, I read it pretty fast, but mm -hmm. uh, that really bothered me what happened to Francisco because I knew people who I thought had gone, whom I'd known, who I thought had gone downhill and I thought, okay. And then I don't see him anymore. And I don't know what, what went wrong, but that happens, but you, you know, yeah. then, yeah. yeah. And it was, it's, it was troubling, but I thought, you know, that happens. People do go downhill and look what happened to Francisco. Oh, oh, well, that's painful. But it didn't occur to me that there was a secret behind it and that I was going to find out something else. Right. But you get to see her dealing with a contradiction. And yes, I Ayn yeah. Rand illustrates that so well. What do you do when you have, when you hold a contradiction on a person like Francisco? And with that, you see her struggling. And the words that Ayn Rand uses with the Dagny a lot, you know, Jim's is don't bother me, don't bother me, or it seems like with Dagny, it's, I see. Mm -hmm. I yeah, see. I observe. And, and it's her. Amazing. And I see things, I see them. Yeah. So she's so fact focused. She's beautiful that way. And um, and I think, I know we need to wrap up now, but um, but I, if you want to do a final round, just, just a quick capping off on um, Dagny and her childhood and her coping strategies she's in her, and her view of herself, Andy. Sure. No, I just want to go back to, to what I was saying before. I think the, the lesson here for, for, for us, you know, as many uh, really positive points here, but again, the, the role of values in, in, in human life, the, with all, with all the, 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 the different permutations of, of Dagny's specific losses, and, and Shoshana, you did a really good job of showing the differences, but what keeps you going, you know, through it, you know, through the the mystery and the the contradiction of Francisco and the agony of the the, the destruction of the John Galt line is that that there's something enormously positive in your life, some gigantic value. And Dagny, all of Ayn Rand's heroes and heroines are, are valuers. They're committed to, you know, what they love. And again, I want you know, I want to stress here, more morally, you know, Ayn Rand shows us in her characters, and she explains in in her philosophy that values are always life promoting. You know, you know, drugs are not a value to a drug addict and power is not a value to a power luster. They're mistaken in thinking that. They're the things people go after because they don't have values. And so, you know, Dagny's life is just, just permeated with values. She loves, you know, the railroad, the way Roth loves architecture. This, is, this, is, this to me is one of the most beautiful points you know, that, that, that I learned from Ayn Rand, and I think a lot of people learn from Ayn Rand. You, know, you could come out of a crazy family, uh, you might be scarred and you might need to do, you know, work with somebody like you, Ellen, and in, in, you know, professionally in, in, in your field. You know, I live in a crazy world, we do, uh, but as long as it's still, you know, relatively free, if we have values, we could bring tremendous meaning into our life, despite all of the all the negative things. And Dagny Taggart, you know, uh, in, in Atlas Shrugged, Howard Rock in the Fountainhead, they're, I mean, they're, they're paradigm examples of this beautiful lesson that Ayn Rand's showing us. And she's got values of character too, her independence, her sense of justice. Yeah, her so virtues, Shoshana, her virtues, right. Her virtues, right. Shoshana? Right. Well, as Andy was talking, I noticed, you know, you, values is a very good term, but you kept saying love. And I think that that's a good, concise way to think about Dagny is that she's in love. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she's in love with herself, the superlative value that is herself. We're told that. And that's why she thinks, you know, no, no, no plane crash can kill Dagny. She's not, <laughs> she's not going down, you know, and, and she's in love with the people she loves and she's in love with the railroad and she's in love with the day, you know, that no day should die behind her without something accomplished. And she is motivated by 
what she loves. And, um, and that's a very good message to find what you love and not to let go. Right. And even when we go back to the, the cabin, she fills her day doing building. She's still building. So even when you hit a rough spot in your life, keep those values alive, keep them vibrant. Like she's building trellises and planting flowers. <laughs> you know, it's not on the scale of a transcontinental railroad, but it's the stand-in or temporary stand-in for the things she loves and values. So never give up your values. Thank you, Andy, for that and, and Shoshana. Mm -hmm. And to be continued. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>